Hi, my name is Autumn Dixon with a balanced saint of mind.com. And this week is August 2nd through 8th, and it is Doctrine and Covenants, section 85 through 87. Though what I really want to be talking about today happens in section 86. So it is a further explanation on the parable of the wheat and tares. So this is a parable that Christ gave a long time ago. It's in the Bible. And section 86 further talks about it. So just to give a basic rundown of this parable, there is a man and his servants and they go in and they sow good seed in the master's field. And then they all go to bed. And when they wake up, there are tares among the wheat that they planted. The servants are confused like, why are there tares? Like you used good seed. And the master says, an enemy hath done this. And so the servants are like, well, do you want us to go rip up all those tares? And the master says, no, because you might accidentally rip up the wheat as well. So that's the most basic version of the parable. Now, a really basic interpretation of that parable is that the Lord allows his children and the children of Satan to grow together in this world. He has chosen to do that. And then when he comes back, the tares and the wheat will be separated. His children will be separated from the children of Satan and be burned. The tares will be burned. Now, many of us have studied this parable before, but I want to talk about it because I believe that there are a couple things that can be emphasized and potentially a couple of new perspectives that you can take with you regarding this parable. Now, a lot of these perspectives, I guess, kind of revolve around the tares themselves, what they are and what they do to the wheat around them. Now, there are some scholars who actually believe that tares, these tares that Christ is talking about, are Darnell weeds. Darnell. And there's a lot of reasons why they believe this. So Christ, when he used parables, he often used things that were very common to the people that he was teaching, right? Things that they would understand really well. And in Christ's time, there was a Roman law that you were not allowed to sow Darnell seeds in your enemy's wheat field. <laughs> there was an actual law. You weren't allowed to do that. So it kind of makes sense that Christ was using this parable. Now, Darnell is, it looks like wheat until it grows up. Another reason why we can believe that Darnell's tears. It houses crop pests and diseases. It is poisonous to people and cattle. It takes very little Darnell to actually really lessen the quality of a wheat crop. And I mean, really the only use for Darnell is it can be used for erosion control, but most experts believe that all of its negative effects, they just, it's just not worth it to use Darnell as erosion control. So I want to kind of talk about these qualities of Darnell or these quality of these tears and help it kind of pull up more implications from this parable for our own lives. The first characteristic, tares look like wheat, right? So in Matthew 13, Christ says that the tares are children of Satan. Okay, they're children of Satan. In Doctrine and Covenants section 86 in verse 3, this is what he says about the tares. It says, and after they have fallen asleep, so the master and the servants, after they have fallen asleep, the great persecutor of the church, the apostate, the whore, even Babylon, that maketh all nations to drink of her cup, in whose hearts the enemy, even Satan, sitteth to reign. Behold, he soweth the tares, wherefore the tares choke the wheat and drive the church into the wilderness. So Matthew 13 teaches us tares are children of Satan. This verse teaches us that Satan sits in their hearts and reigns. Now, the reason that I want to emphasize this point is because Christ did not give us earthly labels that will help us distinguish tares from wheat. He merely said that Satan dwells in their hearts. Now, 
tares look like wheat, right? So they look like wheat, which leads me to believe that tares can be non-members and people who are actively fighting the church, but tares can also be in the church. Tares can be leaders. Tares can be your parents. Tares can be you. They look like wheat, right? Now, I am not making this point. I'm not emphasizing this point so that you can look at people in your ward or people in your family or look at your parents and say, yeah, that person, they're a tear, right? That is not my point in making this video. My point in making this video is so that you can look within yourself and look for any tear qualities that you might have within yourself. Parables have layers of meaning, right? So we had that basic interpretation that I talked about in the beginning, where the tares, the children of Satan, and the tares, the children of the Lord, are growing together. But there's parable mean parables have layers of meaning. And in my mind, there are many of us that have wheat and tear tendencies within us. We have both. So I want to talk about two Christ-like traits, two characteristics. There's a million ways that these tears can manifest through us, but I want to talk about two specific examples, and then we're going to take the principles out of those examples and apply it to other scenarios, what other situation you might find yourself in. So the first one that I want to talk about is humility. So specifically, tear humility. So it looks like humility, but it's actually a tear. It's not real humility. What does that look like? So the most basic example that we all stereotypically think of is the person who is pretending to be humble when really they're prideful deep down. But that's the most obvious one. There's other ways that this manifests, right? So another way is when we tear ourselves down too much, saying, I'm not worth anything. I'm not that great. And some people sincerely feel that way. And then some people are saying, kind of tearing themselves down in an attempt, a futile attempt to be humble. When in actuality, it's not true, true humility because you're telling your heavenly father he's wrong. Because heavenly father believes, he believes in us, right? We're his children. He knows our potential. He loves us. And we're telling him that he's wrong when we're tearing ourselves down. And anytime that we're telling heavenly father that he's wrong, that's pride. <laughs> that is not humility. Another way that it can manifest is simply through, I guess, our own spiritual gifts when we're tearing down our own sp spiritual gifts or we are, there's a small miracle and people are like, oh, your talk was so great. Thank you. I really needed to hear that. Or your lesson was so great or whatever it might be. Or you came right at the exact moment and we're like, oh no, like that wasn't a big deal. Like don't turn that into a big deal. I feel like society has taught us to reject com compliments to be like, oh, no, 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 that was nothing, that was nothing, right? That is tear humility. And I'm going to use this big blown up example <laughs> so that we can very easily see how this is a ridiculous thing to do when we're doing it on a smaller level, right? So Moses. Moses parts the Red Sea. It's this incredible miracle. They get to the other side. They no longer have this threat of the Egyptians coming after them. And the children of Israel are just falling all over themselves telling Moses that he is so great, that he did so awesome. They can't believe how amazing he is that he was able to part this Red Sea. Moses, in turn, does not obviously soak this in and think he's so great. And Moses does not be like, oh, like it wasn't that big of a deal. It wasn't that big of a miracle. No big deal, right? He's not saying those things, right? True humility attributes it to God, right? Moses would be saying, it wasn't my power. He just worked through me. This is Heavenly Father's power. True humility turns outward and it attributes these small, incredible miracles to our Heavenly Father, right? So we're talking about tear humility that looks like humility. We think it's humility, but it's not. And we want to get rid of those things. We want to have true humility, right? So instead of trying to tone down our spiritual gifts or instead of trying to be like, oh, it wasn't that great, instead adequately appreciating these gifts that Heavenly Father has given us, being able to live them out loud so Heavenly Father can actually utilize these gifts that he gave you, but then in turn, turning them back towards our Heavenly Father, feeling gratitude for that, these gifts that he has given us. That is true humility, not tear humility. 
Another example, tear charity. Real humility, or not humility, real charity is spontaneous. It's something that you can't really help when you really love somebody, right? So when you really love someone and you hear people kind of talking down on them a little bit, you can't help but defend themselves, like it just, or defend them. You can't help but defend them because you love them so much. Or when you're kneeling down and you're praying and you find yourselves praying about them and praying for them because you love them so much. That's real humility. Or hum I keep saying humility because I've been talking about it for a while. That is true charity. When you really actually love somebody. Tear charity is kind of backhanded. It's arrogant. It comes with a bless her heart kind of attitude. And if you're not from the South, let me explain that a little bit. Um, the stereotypical way that we see, oh, bless her heart, is a bunch of people are together and they're just kind of tearing down somebody else and they're tearing them down and at the end they're like, oh, bless her heart. And all of a sudden that little phrase at the end, it kind of just excuses the rest of the stuff that they just said about this person. It's not real charity. They think that they're going to be okay because they said bless their heart and they're going to pat themselves on the back. And that is the kind of tear charity that drives me the most insane is when you are patting yourself on the back for loving somebody because that's not real charity. It may look like charity. Oh, I'm loving them. I'm showing up at their house with brownies. But if you're patting yourself on the back for being righteous and for loving them, that is tear charity. It's not real. If you have time to pat yourself on the back for loving somebody, it's not real love. It is tear charity. It's not real. It's tolerating. It's There's not real respect there. It's not real. So as another big example of this, people, you don't have to love somebody in order to die for them, right? Some people love themselves so much <laughs> that they're willing to die for somebody to look righteous, right? These actions can look charitable. That's what I'm trying to say. These actions can look charitable. They can look like wheat, but we have to dig all the way deep down and make sure that it is actually wheat, that it's actually coming from a place of true humility and true charity. We have to examine our actions and make sure that they're not tear inside, that they don't just look like wheat, but they are wheat. We have to not only act like Christ, we have to become like Christ. So that was characteristic of number one of Darnell of Tares, they look like wheat. Number two, they house crop pests and diseases. So these tares hold pests that can hurt other wheat and it can, they hold diseases that can ruin a crop of wheat. Now, I wanna kind of go back to that example of tear charity to kind of further the implications of this parable. When someone is patting themselves on the back for loving somebody else, when they're merely tolerating somebody, not actually loving them, it spreads spiritual disease. Let me explain that a little further. So <laughs> people can feel when you don't really love them. It might be subconscious, but they can feel it. They can feel when your charity is coming from a place of true charity. You legitimately care about them. You see the good in them. You see their potential. You love them versus when you are loving them out of sense of duty or out of self-righteousness. <laughs> People can sense when you're tolerating them, when you don't actually love them and it affects them. It affects them. It drives them away from church, honestly. <laughs> when you don't actually love them, it spreads spiritual disease. We learn what love feels like from other people. We have a veil over our eyes, and so we don't remember what it was like to be loved by our Savior or by our Heavenly Father. That is something that gets retaught to us here on earth. And so if you are not actually loving someone, if you are tolerating them and patting yourself on the back for being charitable, they will feel that and that's what they're going to attribute to their savior and are they going to want anything to do with their savior if that's what they think he is no they're going to step away you spread spiritual disease 
when you have that tear charity or the tear humility, you are affecting the wheat around you. So once again, look inwardly, see if your actions are reflecting true feelings or if they are just mimicking wheat. Third thing from the parable that I want to talk about. So the tares and the wheat grow together. Okay, so I want to read a verse. This is section 86 of Doctrine and Covenants, and it is verse 6. So the Lord is saying that he wants the tare and the wheat, the tares and the wheat to grow up together. It says, But the Lord saith unto them, Pluck not up the tares while the blade is yet tender, for verily your faith is weak, lest you destroy the wheat also. So the servants who are representative of the angels, want to go and take out the tares and the Lord says no because you might rip up the wheat. I don't think when the Lord says that he's not actually meaning like angels don't go down and destroy wicked people because you might accidentally kill somebody who's righteous. <laughs> I don't think that's actually what he means. In this verse we're learning that the faith is still weak. The Lord wants time for that faith to grow. Now when you put that in context of the real world, it makes perfect sense, right? What would happen if good guys always won immediately? <laughs> if the bad guys were just destroyed immediately, if the angels came down and just automatically ripped up those tears, took them out. First of all, we'd all be burned because we are, we've all been tears at one time or another. In one action or another, we have not been truly charitable or truly humble or truly Christ-like. We're all guilty of that. So first thing that would have happened is we would have all been destroyed. Second thing is we wouldn't grow. Our faith would have no opportunity to grow. How much faith does it take to do the right thing if you know you're going to be destroyed immediately for doing the wrong thing? <laughs> it doesn't take that much faith, right? How much faith does it take to do the right thing in the face of all of Satan's disguises? How much faith does it take to look around and see problems and see people who maybe aren't fully living Christ-like lives but are pretending to and are hurting other people? How much faith does it take to live amongst that and to remain faithful to our Heavenly Father, to our Savior Jesus Christ? It takes way more faith and compassion to look around us and see the problems and to stick around anyway to keep doing the right thing. It takes immense faith to be able to do that. The Lord let the tares and the wheat grow together as a gift to us so that we can grow to become like him. My very last point that I want to talk about. There are many of us personally who have left the church because of tares. And there are also many of us who have loved people who have left the church because of tears. My warning in this, the reason I want to bring this up, is I warn you not to label those people, the people who left the church, not to label those people as tears. And I'm not warning you about this because It'll drive them away from the church even further because it will drive them further away from the church if you are viewing them as tares. <laughs> That'll drive them farther away. I'm warning you not to label them as tares for you because you don't actually know whether they're tares, right? <laughs> In the beginning, we talked about how it looks like wheat. Tares look like wheat. There are no earthly labels that we've been given, no earthly criteria to be able to distinguish between wheat and tares. It is something that happens in somebody's heart. And so we don't actually know whether they're tares. So when someone has left the church, do not label them as a tear. You don't get to do that because <laughs> you don't know. And that's true doctrine because you look at Jacob in the Book of Mormon and he was telling the Nephites that they were more wicked than the Lamanites despite the fact that the Lamanites were murderers, <laughs> right? They were killing some of the Nephites, but the Lamanites were more righteous than the Nephites, because the Nephites weren't loving their wives. That's true doctrine. You can't truly tell what's going on in some, someone's heart. You don't know, unless the Lord reveals it to you, <laughs> which, anyway, we won't get into that. 
do not label them as tears because first of all, you're gonna miss a lot of good qualities that that person still has. That person may still very much be wheat and you just don't see it. It will be to your own detriment if you choose to see other people in the lens of tears. It's not helpful to you or to anybody else. I am grateful for a savior who has given me time to overcome my tear tendencies. I am grateful for a savior who is letting all of this happen so that I can grow to become like him. And I am grateful for a savior who performed the atonement, who's gonna make up for all of the problems that I have caused other people <laughs> and all of the trials that I've experienced as well. He's gonna give that happy ending to everybody and he's gonna make up for all of these problems that come with these tears. And he's gonna allow us to live with these tears so that we can grow with our own personal tears and with tears that come in others, he's gonna let us live with that. Let us, because he wants us to grow to become like him. And I'm grateful for his wisdom in doing that. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.